This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be with you. And a big welcome again to the inimitable Paul Bindig. How are you, sir? Oh, really good. Thanks, Dave. Um, So last episode was a bit of a big one for us in that we talked to Steve Porcaro. And and for me, that was a bit of a, a bucket list moment. Um, and this episode, I get to place another big tick on my little bucket list. Um, as a kid growing up in the country, I, I had very limited access to live shows. I don't know about you, Paul, but I think by the age of 18, my sum total of live music was The Radiators, Rose Tattoo and The Cockroaches. Yeah, growing up in Adelaide, I had a bit more access, but as a young bloke, cash strapped, you weren't getting out too much. So yeah, hadn't hadn't seen too much back then in those days either myself. I didn't know what a big concert looked like. No, let's put it that exactly. way. Exactly. And so yeah, I, I was the same. And so um, yeah, one uh, fateful year, nineteen eighty six, um, commercial TV decided to run an evening dedicated to a specific band playing live. And not only were they playing live, they're playing the twenty first night in a twenty obviously in a twenty night uh, night run at one venue in Sydney, Australia. Uh, so that's 13,000 people roughly a night for 21 nights um, and they filmed their last show, was televised on commercial uh, TV live, I think, um, and it changed my life. That was my first end-to-end concert from a big international act and that band was obviously Dire Straits and on that stage with a very impressive keys rig and even more impressive chops was Mr Alan Clark. So that's who we have on the show um, today. And as you'll hear, we had a ball chatting to Alan um, on everything from Dire Straits to Tina Turner to uh, Trevor Horn, his upcoming solo piano album, you name it, we cover it. So hope you enjoy it. Alan, thank you so much. Look, it takes dedication to do an interview on a Monday morning and it's or a Monday lunchtime. Um, really appreciate your time. No problem. I mean, we're 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 kind of locked down in England now, so um, it's um, it's a it's a welcome change to my normal routine. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit like that. It is a regular question of our guests: is how you have kept busy during what's been an incredibly challenging year worldwide, and I know UK. Um, certainly has had some real challenges over the last year. So how have you been keeping busy in these times? Well, I've, I've, I've been surprisingly busy, actually, because I, I work quite a lot with uh, producer Trevor Horn. Mm. So, um, we, we've done, like, uh, last year we did several, and, and still are doing several projects. Um, I've been doing several projects with him, so that's kind of kept me busy, and uh, as well as doing my own... Um, Bit of recording for my own forthcoming piano album and um, and one or two other things. I, I have a studio at home as well, so I kind of work in that too. So I've been surprisingly busy actually compared to most people who are sitting around uh, with, hoping gigs will quickly come back. Yeah, exactly. And we're definitely going to talk um, about your album and also your work with Trevor. So look, yeah, look forward to speaking about that. Um, but let's start off, Alan, with a bit of a potted history of yourself. And just for our listeners to... Um, I'm sure Alan will give us a great recount of his early history, but Alan's own website and blog is brilliant, provides some superb 
uh, anecdotes and history, um, which is well worth a read, and we'll link to that in the show notes. But yeah, just your childhood, Alan, what got you into music in the first place? I'd, I'd be really interested to hear. I think I was uh, spotted by my parents uh, plunking on a piano in someone's house. Um, when I was about three or four, you know, just sort of reaching up and playing notes and obviously showing an interest in um, in music. So um, I was sent to piano lessons when I was six years old. And um, I guess it started from there, really. <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> I have to say piano lessons, um, I got really bored with piano lessons really quickly because... They kind of teach you that they were teaching me stuff I didn't really want to know, <laughs> so um, I gave that up when I was after after about I think when I was about nine I stopped and then and then I started playing um, by ear, teaching myself uh, pretty much. Um, my dad sort of taught me some basic stuff because like, he was a, a very very basic piano player, <laughs> extremely basic actually, um, but he sort of um, set me on the road. And um, and that was it, really. I just sort of took off from there. No, interesting. And did you recall uh, when you said you taught yourself by ear? What were some of the songs you first um, started, you know, plodding along to? What my dad taught me was um, um, uh, C major, A minor, F major, and G. Yeah. And um, and he made that he made those chords work in every tune because they they were the only chords he knew yeah <laughs> he played dun da dun da dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba and um he played blue moon which those chords yeah. fit perfectly <laughs> but um but he he thought somehow made those chords fit into every tune which kind of um quickly um irritated me so i found other chords uh <laughs> to uh to make other tunes work basically but that's how it all started Brilliant. In the key of C. <laughs> That's the way. Well, to... my, my my auntie taught me to play Blue Moon in the key of C when I was a real young bloke as well too. So we've got something in common there, Alan. That's possibly about the only thing we, we have in common. I, I haven't played it live aid. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's universal, isn't it, that chord progression? It is, yeah. It's, it's the essence of all uh, popular music really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it certainly is. Uh, what do you be possible for you to share with us, um, so, you know, through your formative years, obviously you, you started to play by ear and found some other chords and some music that you liked. C- can you talk to us a bit about, uh, as, a, as, a, as a young adult, exploring the world of music and, and some of the projects and things you, you worked on uh, perhaps before your, your days of Dire Straits? Um, well, I started playing in working man's clubs in, in northern England um, because um, I just happened to arrive uh, – in life, a perfect, the perfect opportunity because um, working man's clubs were springing up all over England, and um, mm. uh, they had they had pianos in them. But then, when they Hammond organs started to arrive from America, and um, they all wanted Hammond organs, and the piano players that they had in their clubs couldn't play Hammond organs because the transition mm. from a piano to a Hammond organ mm. isn't, isn't easy. Um, so. Uh, as it happened, I uh, my dad had taken me into the Hammond organ shop, which had opened up in uh, Chesterley Street, which is the um, town I went to school in. And um, of all the places in the world for a Hammond organ shop to open in, in tiny little Chesterley Street, but it just happened to be the the perfect distribution centre for the whole north of England. So, um, long story short, I I joined there after school. Sometimes used to skip school and spend all day in it, actually, but don't tell anyone. And um, <laughs> and, um, and uh, after after just a few weeks or months or whatever, I can't really remember. But um, the guy who was uh, the manager of the shop, who was selling the organs to the clubs, also had a pool of organ players uh, who he was sending out. And um, soon there were more organs going out than he had organ players. So he asked my dad if I could go out. And I think I was like 13 years old. So wow. I started my professional career in working man's clubs when I was 13. And very soon I was making more than my father, just working for over a weekend, wow. maybe a Friday, Saturday and Sunday nights. When my dad worked, you know, like a long shift with overtime in a cable factory. So I was making yeah. more than him very quickly. So I thought, mm, this is, this could work, you know. 
Al, Al, was that a exciting experience for a, for a young teen or an intimidating experience? Or you know, how, how did you find that environment, which would have been a very unique experience for you as opposed to other boys of your age? Yeah, it was really. Yeah, I mean, I missed out on the whole bunch of other stuff that other kids were doing, but um, at weekends, you know. But uh, I wasn't particularly bothered because, um, yeah, I, I used to really like it, and and I discovered how to. Um, I discovered that if you play something like really good to your own satisfaction, then and 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 you are good enough, then it gets a response from the audience. I, I discovered basically how to how to I discovered applause basically and um, which is what uh, I think ultimately what drives us all on mm, yes yeah um, obviously the, you, you fell in love with performing um, so fr- from there you were so you were your 13 year old young man obviously really enjoying the fact that you're uh, being warmly received at the clubs and earning a bit of money which is fantastic where to from there as, as a young adult I spent a year working on a cruise ship when I was 19, 19 years old, in a band, yep. which um, which sailed out of Miami every Saturday at four o'clock, and then went round the Caribbean, and and then was back in Miami on Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. New bunch of passengers, so a week long cruise, mm-hmm. and um, so I, I did that for a, for a year, an entire year, which was a great experience. Got took me abroad. I saw a bit of the world and um, and grew a love for the Caribbean, and um, and then after that I came back and started working in nightclubs in England and 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 just dossing around doing this that and the other. And then I thought, well, I've got to start taking this a bit more seriously. So I I um, started. Uh, I joined one or two bands in the north of England. Um, one of which uh, Brian Johnson from ACDC was the singer in. And um, never heard and of that them, Alan. To... Never heard of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're quite a the big band. I think they're from Australia. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, um, we'll have to check them out when we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should really. Yeah. <laughs> a bit noisy, but good. Um, I, I'm imagining the music scene in, in Northern England was pretty vibrant back then. Um, I know, you know, there was. You know, an emerging sort of heavy sort of scene coming out of there as well. Was that what it felt like to be involved in it at the time? Yeah, I suppose there were lots of good bands. I mean, you know, and I mean, Sting was playing in in a uh, in, in some pub. I never I never saw him, but apparently he was. You know, and um, I met him much later when he was yep. um, a big star. Um, and uh, yeah, there were lots of lots of good music coming out of there. I, I ended up when I started working with bands. I my names I must have got round a bit, and I then I got asked by Splinter, who were a, um, a duo who were signed on George Harrison's Dark Horse label. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Um, and so I started doing some work with them, touring most of the time. We we the first tour I did was supporting Greg Allman and Cher. They were doing wow. a tour of Britain, and, oh, and Splinter cool. supported them, and. Um, and uh, the first the first time I met George was um, backstage at the Hammersmith Odeon when we were playing there with uh, when I was playing there with Splinter. So um, and that led to I can't remember what led to what, but uh, I I ended up playing with um, Gallagher and Lyle. And um, mm. and uh, one of the uh, people who worked for Dire Straits heard me playing with Gallagher and Lyle and when Dire Straits needed a keyboard player that was the connection which I've only just really discovered uh, recently that um, that's I've often wondered how I came from Di- from Gallagher and Lyle to Dire Straits but um, apparently somebody saw me and, and right. recommended me right yeah so, so, that's, so was it... that's the short story there was a lot of other stuff in between but you know so, so with the Dire Straits gig, was it a case of uh, you, you picked up the phone one day and it was like, okay, uh, we, we've, we've heard you might be the right guy for the band, would you like to come on down? Or was there an audition process? Or, you know, how, how did that all actually come into place that you ended up being a, a permanent member of the band? Uh, they carefully avoided the word audition. Yep. I remember I was in line in bed, actually, one sunny morning, um, about it must have been about ten thirty. I was still in, I was still in bed. The phone rang downstairs, so I ran downstairs and um, 
answered the phone and it was uh, it was uh, Paul Cummins who was the um, assistant manager of Dire Straits mm-hmm. and um, and he said um, would you would you be interested in coming to uh, play with a with a um, quite a well known band um, I can't tell you who it is. I said, oh, well, forget it then. <laughs> if you can't tell me who it is, I'm not interested. So he told me who it was. And then I, and, uh, he told me who it was. And, um, and I knew who they were because a, fr- a, fr- a good friend of mine was a big fan of Dire Straits, yep. which, um, I mean, I, so I heard, I heard the music, but it wasn't that interesting to me because there wasn't a keyboard player in it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It was like a, sure, yeah. it was just a, just a, 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 um, a guitar band. So, I had a limited interest in it, but I obviously saw the um, the talent, and um, and the first time I, I so so basically I um, he he picked me up at um, Kings Cross Station, and uh, in the car on the way to the to the uh, rehearsal, they were rehearsing for a, for for their next tour. I heard. The Making Movies album, which they just finished recording mm. with um, Roy Batan playing keyboards. <laughs> so uh, that was the first time I heard Romeo and Juliet and Tunnel of Love on the car, in the car on the way down to the rehearsal. Wow. Um, wow. And, and, I, and I never really came back after that, really. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. You know, I was there for, I rehearsed with them for a week. And uh, at the end of that week, I said, yeah, welcome to the band. Yeah, that's that's incredible. W- was it a instant sort of feeling of personalities fit well, and it was it was going to work well, or did, did yeah you know, did that develop during the yeah. week? Or, yeah, yeah, we got on, we got on great, and um, yeah, cool. What was particularly good was I started throwing in ideas of intros and stuff like that right from the word go, and um, Mark was very receptive to that, and always was throughout my entire time so it was a very creative um period for uh for me and it was a good outlet for my ideas really yeah it's wonderful and and alan just i mean that that's a fascinating story being in the car hearing making movies roy batan um you know doing that playing do you think your huge amount of experience from age 13 helped your confidence as far as if I'm going along to an audition and, I, and I'm realising that the guy that's played keyboards in this band before me, even if just in the studio, you know, is an E Street band member, I'm probably getting a little bit anxious. How are you feeling going to that audition? I don't recall feeling anxious. I probably was, you know, like uh, slightly, but um, uh, no, I was just, um, let me at it, you yeah, know. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. That's the advantage of youth. Yes. yes. <laughs> Indeed. So, so let's talk about, and this is impossible to cover in one podcast, obviously your history with Dire Straits, but I'm just interested maybe some key standouts for, for you from a keyboard playing viewpoint of those amazing years, obviously between uh, 80 and uh, 80 and um well, there was a little higher. 90s, so we're in the 90s, really. That's when, right, 95, yeah. Playing. That's right. Mm. So just it, what, what are some things that do stand out for you? And, and I'm going to ask you about Live Aid in a little while, but just beyond that, are some other things that stand out for you? What stands out? Um, well, making, making Brothers in Arms in, in mm. Montserrat was, a, was a, a, fabulous, um, a fabulous time because, like I said before, I love the Caribbean, so... Um, um, that was a. Uh, I saw. I spent another virtually three months on the on the uh, beautiful island of Montserrat, wow. making brothers in arms. That was um, that was uh, just fabulous. Just a glorious time. And um, and of course we made a good album as well. Yeah. And just just quick, was, just briefly on that, Alan. And it's a, it's a cliche question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And that is, did you realise at the time? How good an album you no. made? No, no. I mean, I knew Money for Nothing. I thought this was going to be a massive hit because of the guitar, yeah, yeah. And just the whole thing. Um, the album, no, nobody knew. No, it's just... in fact Neil, Neil Dorse, the the engineer, um, uh, was quite. You know, he he was pretty pretty convinced it wasn't going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 
because when I was researching, Alan, obviously from an Australian viewpoint, and, and I'm sure you recall this well, is the, the massive stand of nights you did at the Sydney Entertainment Centre, which um, this conflicting yeah. reports, but it's 20 or 21, and either way, it's incredibly impressive. Um, and that was televised, mm-hmm. the last show, and and I was, uh, I've said in the mm-hmm. introduction, that was a life changer for me because that was, as a country boy, the first end-to-end show I'd ever seen on TV from an international act. And I had that thing yeah. taped and I played that thing till that tape wore out. Um, and it, I could only imagine what the touring experience, like how fatiguing that was, albeit a, a fun time, I'm assuming. I just remember the fun. You know, I just remember it being good. And p- particularly in Australia, that was, that was, I just loved a tour in Australia because um, the 21 nights that we did at the Sydney at the, um, at the uh, entertainment center um, and, and everywhere else we played, I'd be windsurfing all day. So I'd literally be windsurfing from, you know, like midday, late morning, midday, all afternoon. And I quite often arrived at the entertainment center in Sydney in my wetsuit. That's brilliant. <laughs> to do the gig, I'd, I'd arrive in my wits to do the, um, have dinner, uh, get changed. Obviously, you have dinner and then uh, do the gig, and and then um, race back to the uh, Siebel Townhouse, which was a fabulous hotel, and um, hit the bar, and then the, the, it would start all again the next day. It was a, a particularly nice, nice. I mean, you know, went surfing all day in the sunshine because it was the um, summer. And then having a having a gig like that at night with no sound check, just turn up, bam, play the gig. Um, what could be better than that? Well, yeah, and ladies and gentlemen, that's that's how you do it when you're part of the biggest band in the world, which Die States arguably were at the that's time. Right. So Absolutely. That's right. It's touring in style, isn't it? <laughs> it is. uh, yeah. And because one of the other fascinating parts of your blog, Alan, again, and I'll and I will point people to it, is your recollections of Live Aid, and I. I Underwhelming is too uh, strong a word for what I believe your experiences were on the day, but I, f- I found it really amusing that because you guys were playing a whole run of shows at Wembley Arena across the road, that for you it was a little bit of, well, let's walk across the road, have some lunch, go on and play, and then go back and play the full show um, later that day. I mean, I'm sure it was memorable, but how, you know, how did you find that day compared to someone turning up you know, raw on the, on the actual event? Um, well, it was a unique experience. So, um, uh, it was, um, yeah, just a unique experience, basically, you know, unique in every way. Um, I mean, I woke up as you can read on my, on my, um, website, I, I woke up at uh, about 9.30, haven't played a show the previous night with Dire Straits, um, in, in, um, in, in an apartment in, uh, Bayswater in London, and uh, and started watching Live Aid on TV while I was still like sit, sitting in bed having my breakfast, and um, knowing that I'd be on that stage sort of later in the day. And then when I drove up to Wembley, I set off kind of early-ish because we we arranged to meet at like one, even though we weren't going to be on till mm, six, I think. Um, so we had lunch and just to make sure everybody got there on time and everything. But of course the roads were empty because everybody by the time I set off up there um everybody was in Wembley, and um the it was the roads were really quiet on the way up so uh and then we had lunch walked across to the uh to the Wembley stadium um but put up by david bailey and uh and then played the show at six o'clock and then immediately walked back across the, the car park to uh, the Wembley Arena, had had some dinner, and then played to another ten thousand people or whatever. <laughs> and of course, we had we were there for uh, a good run of nights, with twelve nights mm. or something like that. And um, and we had various forms of entertainment, including the um, well, lots of them. But what I remember is we had a sushi bar backstage, which was kind of nice, and. Um, and we had a full, a full-on go-kart track set up in an adjoining building. Yeah, I mean, literally a full-on indoor go-kart yeah. track, just for the band, See. which was, uh, which was good. So every, every, after every show, I'd be in there, sort of honing my, 
my carding skills. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and the other bit I love about that blog post, Ellen, is you mentioned the fact that the the first um, note you played at Live Aid was when you started playing those songs, because obviously there were no sound checks. You had, I assume, yeah. part of your rig and then Freddie Mercury's piano. Is that, is that that was pretty much it? That was it, yeah. Um, I had to go on and play a piano I'd never played before. I mean, it was a Steinway, mm. but um, uh, yeah, just you, you, you just on 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 situations like that, you just hope and pray that everything's going to work because you might get up there and you know, and um, that your monitor isn't switched on or something like that. But fortunately, we, our crew were 100, percent and um, it all went terribly well. Indeed. In fact, that's what pretty much launched Brothers in Arms into America because the six o'clock spot was just when sort of the East Coast was well and truly watching and then the West Coast was kind of, you know, joining in, in, in the, it was their morning. And, and so um, it was a good spot for Dire Straits. Yeah, great point. You mentioned... Alan, you know, very overtly that you had a lot of fun in the in the late eighties for three years playing in Eric Clapton's band, and I, I'm curious as to uh, what made that such a great experience for you. Why you, why you really enjoyed playing with with the Eric Clapton band back then at the time so much? Um, because Eric was just a joy to play with, and. Uh, mm-hmm. As was as was the band. I mean, I, I met Steve Ferroni for the first time, and um, and then we've been good mates ever since, actually. And you know, yeah, I mean, great. Steve Ferroni is uh, when it comes to drummers, then suddenly, oh, this is suddenly the real. <laughs> you know, this is this is the real thing. But you know, Steve Ferroni is. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's a good benchmark, you know, and of course Nathan mm. East on bass. Uh, Greg Flynn Gaines was the other keyboard player. Um, Ray Cooper on percussion. Um, Tessa Niles, uh, Katie Kasoon on, on backing singers. Uh, it was just an amazing band. Yeah, it's a well credentialed group, isn't it? Oh, fantastic! I mean, it was it was just pure joy all the time. I remember going across a plane and we played a couple of American tours. And um, in fact, we had Martin Offer on, on rhythm guitar for um, for one of those tours. Mm-hmm. And um, we were like a conquering army. We, we Everywhere we went, it was just like the first number just completely blitzed them. And <laughs> the audience and the, yeah. the audience went nuts. And it was just, <laughs> uh, it was great. And of course, we yeah. were, that was my first experience of, um, of having a, a a private jet, so we we would we would base ourselves um, in let's say in New York and play Philadelphia and neighbouring neighbour sort of towns that you could sort of fly half an hour to or whatever. Sure. So we'd um, we'd we'd assemble in the lobby at five o'clock or, or thereabouts, uh, jump in several limos, would take us to a private airfield, jump into the G four jet where there would be sushi and stuff like that, that we could eat on the way. <laughs> fly, for, fly for half an hour or so to wherever. Um, land. There were limos literally next to the plane, so straight into the limos. The limos would drive to into the arena and park up next, next, virtually next to the stage. We'd go in, play the gig, come straight off stage into the limos, straight into the plane, and we would be back in the hotel in New York, sort of by midnight, and then we'd, <laughs> then we'd, some of us would head straight to the China Club and have a great time. <laughs> Sounds terrible. Yeah, it was a terrible way to be, to to live. I mean, <laughs> that's fantastic. I'm really interested in. in something that you mentioned before. There, you you mentioned you were playing with uh, Greg Fillingain as a second keyboard player in the band and obviously you would have done that in Dire Straits as well with uh, with Guy Fletcher and I'm just I'm curious not sure who was the second keyboard player me or him <laughs> <laughs> we'll say well I'll say he was 
Um, but uh, I'm just curious as to what the experience was like working with another keyboard player, and and how did you do that working with those guys? Was it you know was it something that was easy to do, or did it take a bit of working out who was doing what? No, because I I I, I would just predominantly play Hammond Hammond organ. Mm. Well, and he would do keyboards. Yep. You know, whatever. And then, yeah, so I would play Hammond uh, synthesizer, a little bit of piano. Um, I used to play at the end of Layla on piano. I don't, oh, yeah. I don't know why I was yep. assigned with that. But, um, but uh, yeah, so it was dead easy. And I've been in several yeah. situations like that where um, if there's another keyboard player, it's, I, I'll play Hammond because that's kind of uh, always been my... Yeah, um, first love. If I had to, put, I, I'd play Hammond with anybody. <laughs> you know. Yeah, quite rightly, it, it's a first love for a lot of artists, and rightly so. Um, and just to take a little bit of a step back, just going back to how experienced you were by relatively um, early adulthood. I know with the Love Over Gold album that you know Private Dancer was a, a, a track that didn't make the fi- the final album, and that sort of started your relationship with Tina Turner. And I believe you became her musical director. So just if you want to tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, well, I met Tina Turner when I, I was at the piano, actually running running through with the band in, in the studio, uh, private dancer to record it. And then she came in and, um, and two takes later, she'd, um, we'd recorded the song pretty much. Mm-hmm. I think that's pretty much the way it went. And, um, and then afterwards she asked me, she was going to do, she was lined up to do a tour to promote the record, um, in America supporting Lionel Richie. So she asked me if I'd go and join her on that tour. So, so having nothing better to do, um, because Dire Straits were having a hiatus at the time, and I hadn't mm-hmm. joined her with Clapton's band then, by then, um, I said yes. And uh, so I went I went off there with uh, and Henry Spinetti, an English drummer. He, um, uh, he, he also joined the band. And... Um, so we and and a good time was had by all, and of course the private dancer went to number one in the states while we were on that tour, halfway through that tour, and um, so it was a good time to be with Tina. But the what's particularly interesting is um, one of the one of the songs, one of the records that really um, got to me when I was when I was young, when uh, when I was a kid or whatever, in the sixties was um, was River Deep Mountain High. First time I heard that record, I was completely. It was like, wow, yeah. this is um, this is something else. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it was a joy to um, to play that with her for the first time in rehearsals in on Sunset Boulevard, SIR rehearsal uh, place. It was a it was um, one of those surreal moments. Another one was when I played with with um, the first time I. Um, recorded with Bob Dylan, sort of hearing Bob's voice in, in the headphones and it was uh, that was a similar experience. Yeah. And you predicted my next question, Alan, which was exactly that, so, the, about your working with Dylan because obviously that's an iconic moment for any artist that gets gets to work with him. So, And I can imagine going from Tina Turner to Bob Dylan is a, is a very different experience. What, what were the idiosyncrasies of recording and playing for Bob? With Bob, um, Bob's very spontaneous, um, and uh, and he never really plays anything twice. I, mean, I guess he I guess he must do, but if you leave it for more than half an hour, he probably plays slightly differently. So it was a question of um, just being ready to to record. Um, so I learned to sort of pretty much sit sit down at the keyboards and stay there. Actually, it was Sly, Sly and Robbie, um, the bass player and drummer, Sly, Sly, um, Sly Dunbar and Robbie Shakespeare, who were the, who were the rhythm section. I know that's what they did. They didn't actually sort of wander into the control room very much or whatever. They just sat at their station, sort of reading, I think they were reading sort of like comic books or something. And um, so... They were always there, so because Bob had a habit of just suddenly picking up a guitar and, and starting to play, and um, if you weren't there, you weren't you weren't on that recording, you know. So 
which did happen to me on one. I did get caught out when I had to go to the uh, loo. And um, when I came back, it already started a tune. So I uh, missed out, missed the, I joined in halfway through to the uh, second verse, I think it was. And it worked, it worked out fine. I didn't even know what key it was in. So I had to sort of like yeah. feed, this, um, feed this Hammond organ chord in, um, which was actually a whole tone higher than the actual song, but it sounded great. In fact, in fact, um, uh, Slide and Bar came up to me afterwards and said, man, he says, that chord you put in there on that second verse was amazing. Well, of course, it was just me trying to figure out what key it was in. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes the best things are mistakes or, or um, you know, feeling exactly. away. Um, but, I, yeah, yeah. I, I had never picked up, and I, I'm not a, you know, a hugely um, knowledgeable uh, Dylan fan, but I, I did notice in researching for this interview that, yeah, the amount of outtakes and an alternative version just on that Infidels album alone is mind blowing. So I, I get what you mean by just you had mm. to be on the ball all the time. Well, that that particular song was a version of Blind William Act Hell, uh, which didn't make the album. That version didn't make the album. A, a, a different version did. But that's become quite an iconic um, tune of his. I gather. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great song. I've actually uh, one of the. Um, on my um, solo album, which I'll take this opportunity yeah. <laughs> to mention, um, it's a solo piano album, just me playing piano. And uh, I was invited to do this um, by uh, uh, um, an Italian record company. Um, I, last year, no, the year before last, where are we now? 19, yeah, it was 2019, yeah. 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 Exactly. I played a... Um, I played a, a, a um, a solo piano uh, a concert recital at a, um, at the Milan Piano Festival, mm. which is like a, a long weekend where they they have invite piano players to come and perform in various stages that they have set up. And um, so, uh, and then an Italian record company uh, invited me to make an album uh, based upon uh, songs that I've been involved with like um, Bob Dylan, and so I've got, um, uh, so I played, so I've used I and I and um, License to Kill, which are two two songs from uh, the Infidels right. record that are, that are recorded with Bob, so I've done versions of, the, of those on my solo piano record. And that's, that's due out well, actually, sort of April, May, Alan, I think, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very much looking. Four things, uh, weather, weather permitting. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's it's looking it's looking like it's, that's going to be end of April. Something I wanted to ask you about that upcoming solo piano solo album, Alan, was my understanding of it is that it's it's you playing various songs from from artists that you've worked with and, and recorded with over over your career and. Given how extensive that list is and the breadth of your experience, I, I'm just curious as to how you, what process you used to decide which songs you were going to put on the album. Um, it was fairly easy, actually. Um, although some songs proved to be more difficult than others. Private Dancer, for mm-hmm. instance, is is a tricky one. A tricky one to do a piano solo on. It took me a little while to figure out how to do it. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it was pretty easy actually. I mean, I didn't. I ended up not. Well, I not there's none by Eric Clapton on there, just because um, I did record one, but it's um, it didn't make the album. It could probably come out at some other point. Uh-huh. But um, yeah, it was pretty easy just picking the tunes, which tunes were going to work on on solo piano. You know, the obviously obviously Dire Straits ones are quite easy, like. Love of a Gold and um, yeah. Romeo and Juliet, you know. Yes, yes. Obvious, obvious choices, but um, yeah, it was pretty easy to pick them. I'm actually also really curious, Alan. You, you mentioned right at the outset that you you took formal piano lessons as a as a really young young fellow and were a bit turned off by the formality of it, and then fell in love with it again, learning by ear. Did you did you ever go back and and you know, learn to, to read dots and charts and that sort of stuff, or are you still playing hundred uh, percent by ear these days? 
Um, no, I did. Um, I, well, I must have learned how to play, how to how to how to read music back then. You know, between yes. the age of six and nine, and then and then, yes. I, but I also started. Um, I also started when I was sixteen. I started. Um, I took. Um, I took grade eight piano. I, I went to um, a technical college at Durham. Yes. Um, north of England, and um, did A level music, A level art. Um, G, uh, G, uh, G, GC um, uh, uh, qualifications in England, A level, yes. uh, A level art, A level music, and I did um, grade eight piano and grade eight harmony, which yeah, I've never even heard of. But but um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty uh, it's pretty intense. But I, I did really well, <laughs> and um, so. By then, I'd um, I'd really got stuck. I'd spent a couple of years getting stuck back into um, reading music and doing the whole thing. So, yeah, and it's served me well actually. I mean, I still I still use that. I still use music. I mean, most people around me don't read music in the in the rock industry. Yes. But um, but it's uh, it's a really handy tool actually. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's often the keyboard player's curse is that they they can often find themselves the the one the one person who reads music in the band. <laughs> yes, yes. No, agreed. Actually, Trevor Horn, who who I work with, uh, he he grew up as a bass player. His his father was a bass player in a dance band. Mm -hmm. Trevor used to uh, used to dep in a similar sort of way. You know, he got into it really young. He used to sort of replace his father sometimes in, and uh, stand in. So uh, he grew up learning, learning to read. So he reads music really well. We have that in common as well. He was also born. Um, we were born um, about three miles away from each other. I mean, he's, he's a couple of years older than me. But um, mm -hmm. we were actually from almost exactly the same region of uh, just outside of Durham in the north of England. And uh, But we, we didn't meet until about four years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay, and it, look, and let's, so let's talk briefly about that that working relationship with Trevor Horn, and um, I'm sure there are there are many aspects to it, Alan, but the one that stands out for me is the re reimagining the '80s project, which uh, was that around 2018 or 19. It was it was absolutely amazing. Um, Somewhere around there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? And for those for the, those of our listeners that haven't heard of it, it's it's Trevor's basically. Uh, uh, and I'm guessing even with assistance from you, um, Alan, as far as it ha has used an orchestra and, and reimagined a number of key 80s hits and done them in very, very different ways that are just absolutely stunning. And I believe did so a small number of live shows, including one at Queen Elizabeth Hall in 2018. How was that experience for you, Alan? Just a, a very different sort of um, project. Yeah. Well, um it's good to uh, have, uh, you know, variety is the spice of life, mm. as they say. Um, yeah, working with Trevor's uh, great. It just lets me get on with, um, you know, it just he uses me as a creative tool, really. So um, that's good fun. I mean, I um, don't know what else to say, really. We, we, I was just working with Trevor was it last week um, doing doing another project. We, he has several projects on the go. Yes. And then he, he has this other one, which I, I won't um, reveal. No. But um, which is like a personal one that that when he's in between projects, he has a, he has this project which I've been helping him with as well. So um, and it's, it's always, you know, as you can expect with Trevor, it's um, the standard is uh, extremely high. Yes, yeah, I can imagine. So it's a joy, really. So um, he has a studio in his uh, in his house in um, Belsize Park in North of London. And so I just sort of, even even when, you know, during the past year when the, with this coronavirus business, I, I sort of drive from my house. I, I live in Cheshire, which is kind of halfway up in England. Right. And um, and um, I drive down there and um, just park outside, park, park outside this house, go in and uh, work with them and then drive home and, um, uh, you know, in one go. So I'm never actually exposed to the world, you know, so. That's great. It's, um, mm. it's, uh, it's good. He has, a, he has an amazing studio and, um, 
an amazing engineer sort of uh, working with them and and it's great. It's like it's like staying at Trevor's is like staying in the best boutique hotel in London. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and so with all these projects, Alan, if you had to nominate, you know, a favourite project you've worked on in the last ten years, what do you think it'd be? Um, well, it'd be one of Trevor's probably, yeah. and I think, but. Um, it's a, um, it's a tricky question there. I also played on a, um, a Jerry Rafferty album um, oh, wow. last year, which uh, which is weird because Jerry actually died 10 That's years right. ago this year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's been 10 years. Wow. That. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's 10 years and this this year, yeah. So his, his daughter, Martha, um, got in touch with me to see if I would play on his record. She's putting the record together to uh, commemorate his... 10 years since he died so um that's coming out uh, this year sometime so i played on um i think i did seven tracks uh, in one 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 day um so that was uh that was good and you know with, with jerry it's always it basically it was it was always jerry's vocal so mm-hmm. they were taking vocal from out from maybe tracks that hadn't made an album or there is stuff that he was working on that um, before he died, and um, but it's, it's always great with Jerry. It's always a pleasure, yeah. you know. Oh, that's amazing. I you can't wait to hear that one. And but from, mm-hmm. from one extreme to the other, Alan, you've also done some work, and I'm not sure what context with Pet Shop Boys. Uh, what, what was your involvement yeah. with Pet Shop Boys? And I mean, I'm a huge fan. Just how, how was that? Is something again? Variety is the spice of life. Well, it was. Um, it was uh, because of their association with Trevor, because Trevor oh, produced them. Uh, so it was um, it was live play, playing um, one of the shows that I did with Trevor. I can't remember which one. It might have been the Queen Elizabeth Hall that you mentioned, um, but it was one of the one of the shows there. Oh, I see. I'm a member of Trevor's band now, and um, Trevor's band is is about nine strong, or maybe mm. maybe ten. Yeah. But, uh, there's there's one guy who 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 uh, does what we call the crash bangs and whistles, which is like all of the um, you know samples, which which Trevor has on his record. You know, if you play, you know, Pet Shop Boys or um, you know any of the, any of those um, you know records from the '80s, it's got lots of sort of um, what Trevor calls gags. You know, like um, um, which you know samples basically that sort of appear in the song. So we play live. We were never play. We, you know, there's no never a backing track or anything. But um, so there's there's one guy who actually just play, <laughs> plays the that's, sort of samples, you know, at the, at the appropriate moment. So that's a skill, I'll tell you. Yeah, with my skill level, that's what I'd be putting my hand up for. So yeah, that, that sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> so from working man's clubs as a 13 year old to touring the world with the biggest band in the world, arguably at the time a huge breadth of experience. Are there any key lessons that you've learned that would be great and valuable tips for our listeners, uh, many of whom are also keyboard players? Um, always be humble or try to be because when you, you know, mm-hmm. you get, it's easy to get carried away when you sort of the, in the biggest band in the world. Um, and, uh, Always do, always just play the right thing, really. It's which is a, a skill in itself. Mm. You know, I can't, I can't say I've always been, um, I've always achieved that. But uh, trying is the is the thing that counts. Yeah, yeah. Talking about maintaining humility. I'm going to ask a bit more about that. So, you know, you mentioned playing with Eric Clapton and you go from hotel room to private jet to limousine to stage to limousine to private jet to hotel room to to the club afterwards potentially to have a great time. How do you keep yourself humble when you're in that kind of a whirlwind environment? Uh, Keeping fit is um, is, uh, a good level, which I've always tried to do. Uh Um, I got into yoga when I was um, in my sort of early twenties, and um, mm-hmm. 
that's become a really handy tool to, uh, you know, when you're in a hotel room and, you know, and the, the, the time was back in the 80s and stuff when there weren't many gyms necessarily available to go to in yep. hotels. So uh, that's not the case now. Most of them have gyms and gyms are is much more accessible. But back in those days, it was um, basically I would go go out running. The amount of times I've run around Central Park, I've probably worn the... Uh, the pavement down but um uh yeah so keeping fit basically is uh is a good way of um avoiding the excesses you know because if you know you're going to go windsurfing the next day or then um you might sort of think about going home rather than um staying up (laughs) (laughs) yeah absolutely Absolutely. i didn't always succeed i have to say but you know i tried (laughs) <laughs> so my, my other question which is one that we ask all of our guests alan again particularly with all the various experiences you've had are you able to share with our listeners a potential uh, a technical train wreck that may have occurred on stage that's uh, particularly stuck in your mind well one that springs to mind is i um i played a, a concert with um at a, at a festival with, with mm-hmm. a friends of mine. And um, of course, with a festival, you don't get the sound check. You just go up there and just pray everything's mm-hmm. working. And I, I was playing a, um, my keyboard. It was a, a Yamaha Motif. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, it was a rented one. And um, so, you know, the first time I got the chance to play, it was literally the first song we were playing. And it was it was like about five pitch, five notes out of tunes. It had been <laughs> detuned for some reason, wow. and um, <laughs> so that caught me on the hook. And, and another another one that can happen like that is the um, is when the sustain pedal is in reverse. So oh, oh yes, sustain pedals. Yeah, so <laughs> trying to get through the first number, and thinking about doing the like. Backwards on the sustained pedals are truly <laughs> trippy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like trying to fly a plane upside down. That's not easy. Um, yeah. And- but another one that springs to mind though, when I first came to, um, the first time, when I first played with Eric, I came to Australia. And um, and it was, I was expecting to be, the flu mates to be there. So, um, uh, and of course he wasn't. Uh, and it was just, it was just basically the Eric, uh, Nathan, um, Steve Ferroni and myself. Uh-huh. Uh, did we have? I think we, may, we probably had Katie and and Tessa singing as well. But um, so the whole job of keyboards, which I thought presumed Craig Flynn Gaines was going to be doing, sort of suddenly fell onto my shoulders on, <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the sound check for the first day. So um, that was uh, wow. That was tricky. So, yeah. So that wasn't great. But and and Eric, Eric was um, Eric was um, uh, his mind wasn't on the job. Let's say I think he was. Um, yeah. He he he, uh, he cleaned his act up immediately after that and was absolutely sure. magnificent thereafter and has remained that way ever since. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's one hell of a challenge. And, and Alan, I didn't sort of talk before. We don't usually go into huge depth about gear, but I mean, you mentioned the motif and so on. Do you have sort of I, obviously the Hammond is your go-to piece of gear, but you have other keyboards and stuff that you know you couldn't live without at the moment. Uh, most of what I do now is virtual, you know, to yeah. in Pro Tools and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I use plugins. Um, I ended up buying a. Um, Hammond, Hammond plug-in, uh, which again, I've managed to resist, but uh, up until about six months ago, but uh, I, I did it and it's, it's all right, you know, but um, it's not, nothing like the real thing. Um, I use the motif a lot um, live because it's dead easy mm. and it has, you can do other, other it's, the piano sounds you know, good for live, really. Um, what other gear do I use? Um, I've, in my studio, I've got a clavinet. Oh, yeah. um, I've got a, a Wurlitzer piano. Yeah, nice. I was using the clavinet just the other day on a track I'm working on now, actually, with um, sticking it through one of those, um, you know, like uh, a phaser, like a guitar, oh, yeah. sort of one of those orange boxes. Yeah. Um, 
so the clavinet through there is, uh, is a good guitar simulator when um you know, uh, at the moment, we're being in lockdown. I can't invite a guitar player into my studio, really. So, That's right. Um, clavinet, uh, it's driven me to sort of switch on the clavinet and, um, yeah, <laughs> great things. There they are. Fabulous. Brilliant, but yeah, brilliant piece of gear. And um, so we're, we're on the home stretch here, Alan. I've got two more questions to go, and these are the ones I did give you pre-warning about because we guests can find them stressful choosing. But the first one was <laughs> for you to um, tag a keyboard player that you've either always admired or loved uh, hearing their work that you would find um, fascinating to hear their uh, history in, in the field. Keith Jarrett. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. Great call. Yep. Beautifully answered. I've, I, I'm a fan of Keith Jarrett. Um, I, uh, my my partner Sheila and I um, occasionally uh, travel to exotic places to uh, to see a Keith Jarrett concert. We've been to uh, uh, like a town in northern Spain, which was he was playing at a um, at a, a sort of a, a chateau, a wine chateau, outdoor gig. Um, we we went there. We've been to. We saw him in New York. We've seen him um, in uh, Barcelona, in Spain, and um, the Queen Elizabeth Hall in um, in uh, London. Um, various other places I can't, I can't think. But yeah, so it was. It's been a, a treat to go in to see uh, Keith Jarrett play. Mm, absolutely. Rome, actually. I saw him in Rome as well. Actually, come to think about it, so that one sprung to mind. So. Uh, yeah. No, brilliant, brilliant answer. Love it. And mm-hmm. and then the last one is the, the dreaded Desert Island Disc question. So five albums don't have to be even yeah. keyboard driven, but just five albums you couldn't live without. Uh, there's, there's nothing I couldn't live without. I could quite easily um, go on with Desert Island without any music. Oh, there you go. Um, because I don't, I don't listen to music a great deal, um, very much at all, really, mm. um, because, because I spend so much time... True creating it and it's and i like to get away i like to have a break from music for instance when i'm in the car i listen to radio four yeah which is all talking that's right um so or i listen to a podcast actually actually one of my favorite pod- podcasts is, is australian it's a mysterious universe i don't know if you know it no. it's these two guys with them um, talking about um talking about the sort of esoteric and uh you know like uh, UFO sightings and stuff oh, like that. Wow. It's, it's a good, it, it's it's entertaining. It's a good, um, it's a good laugh. It's good. Um, but uh, yeah, but uh, if you rephrased it and said, if you if you had to take um, five albums, five yeah. albums <laughs> to to the desert island, what would they be? Well, um, I've just been listening to the last the last thing I listened to was on. Um, on Friday, which was uh, the second time I've listened to Bob Dylan's album, Rough and Rowdy. Okay. Although I don't know if that would make my list. I just thought I'd mention that. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so definite, definite for my list would be Inner Visions by Stevie Wonder. Wow, yep. Which was a groundbreaking album. Absolutely. That mm. juncture of my life, sort of in the, what was it, 17? Uh, yeah, early 70s. Yeah. It was, um, that's when it sort of, um, I started taking a bit more serious interest in music than I had been, perhaps. Um, probably um, uh, 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 songs in the key of life, which yeah. I think this might have been after, uh, just after um, in the visions. Um, going a bit further back, Abbey Road by the Beatles. And at least you Absolutely. haven't cheated, Alan, because the amount of guests we have that choose the Beatles box set is insane. So good on you for choosing one. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it would have to be Abbey Road. <laughs> Um, these are just albums that have kind of like really been significant in my, you know, really pricked my ears basically at the time. Um, Weather Report, 8.30, oh, yeah. the live album, 8.30. Yeah. And it's got to be um, the Keith Jarrett, <coughs> excuse me, the Keith Jarrett record, The Melody at Night With You. Brilliant. Do you know that, do you know that album? No, I don't well, but uh, really, it'll definitely be checked out. Well, you should you should listen to that yes. because Keith, well, a lot of people find Keith Jarrett uh, very in, intense and difficult to listen to because it's you know it's it's absolute genius piano playing and 
uh, but um, this this album, which, is, which I think is the, I think it might be the most popular uh, jazz album ever ever made. Uh, I, I think um, don't quote me on that, but um, it's it's well up there. The melody at night with you is Keith Jarrett when he was he was going through his. Um, he had a, he had some sort of debilitating debilitating Ill, illness which um, made him tired all the time. Oh, okay. So he he was and uh, so he made this album during that time. He made it for his wife, and it's pretty basic. Just him just playing tunes basically instead of not much. You know he doesn't go off extemporizing and you know you, recognizable um, tunes. Uh, played quite simply certainly for him but it's just absolutely magnificent as you can imagine yes a brilliant pick and i think that's a lo- so, lovely pick to wrap up to in in a week where very sadly we've lost chick career as obviously another iconic um jazz player as well yes. so um mm-hmm. no absolutely appreciate it and i can't thank you enough alan for your time i mean i feel like we've barely scratched the surface and i think we have only scratched the surface given the 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 um, length and, and substance of your career, but we very much appreciate you taking the time to, to give us the information that you have and um, look forward to you keeping safe and um, can't wait to hear about some of these projects coming out of the works in the next six to 12 months. Cool. All right. Been a pleasure, man. Thank you. And there we have it. Look, I'm still looking for that bastard, mate, that that guest that, you know, isn't forthcoming and isn't generous with their time and isn't full of wonderful insights. And I'm afraid to say Alan's let us down. He's all of those things. And he, he you know, I can't thank him enough for, for doing the great stuff he has. Yeah, what, what a gentleman. And, and, and I say this every time we, we do an interview, David, I just think it goes to prove that all keyboard players are just nice guys. <laughs> That's right. There's got to be an exception. But we certainly didn't find that tonight. Yeah, so no, really appreciate Alan's time. And um, it sounds like he's got some exciting things on the boil. And if you do, yeah, do check the, the show notes for a couple of those links. And I, I know I'm certainly going to be checking out his solo piano album. Um, I saw some video of when he talked about his Milan uh, performance. And he does a version of Telegraph Road that was just stunning. That Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that's on the album. But yeah, can't wait for it. All right, so we'll be back again in two to three weeks, um, but just a reminder that you can keep in touch in the meantime via a few means. So our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles, Twitter at the C, the, the C board, the keyboard CHR1, and then our good old fashioned email address is editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, we do have a Patreon account if you'd like to become an official supporter, and thanks to those of you that are already doing so, um, where for the price of a coffee a month, you can help us go from strength to strength and hopefully get more and more guests on and, and do more and more in-depth interviews. Uh, the address for that Patreon is patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles, just for something different. Uh, Paul, thank you and um, again for joining us. We're having a bit of a late one. It's, it's now past midnight. That just shows you how dedicated we are. It's because we love what we do, and it's a pleasure to work with you again on this wonderful podcast. So thanks for having me along, David. Thank you. And then most importantly, thanks to you all out there for listening, and we hope to see you back here next episode.